The Night Beat starts right now. Basic infection precautions were not being met. The lovingly home assisted living facility shut down in Leon Valley. It is our top story tonight. The facility had five positive COVID-19 cases, including one death. Staff at the facility given five days to find new homes for their residents. Metro health officials say the shutdown comes because they were not practicing safe health procedures. The facility also had growing COVID-19 cases, which led them to test both residents and staff members. There were five positive cases out of the seven people tested. According to the Health and Human Services website, the facility had 55 violations in March of 2019. Let's take a quick look at the latest numbers tonight. Bear, tonight, Bear County has 2,636 confirmed cases of COVID-19. That's an increase of 53 cases since yesterday. We also have one new death to report tonight. That brings the death toll to 72. When breaking these numbers down, 32 of the new cases are from the community, two from congregate settings, 19 are still under investigation. 91 people are hospitalized, 40 are in intensive care, 25 on ventilators, 60,000 tests have been given in Bear County so far. A maintenance employee at VIA has tested positive for COVID-19. The employee was last at work on April 9th. VIA officials say the employee had little to no contact with the public. However, they were in close contact with someone who did test positive for the virus on May 15th. As of now, two administrative employees, one maintenance worker and seven VIA operators have tested positive. Into other news, the Southwest Research Institute right here in San Antonio hoping to equip rocket engineers with knowledge that's quickly disappearing. Southwest Research has had a hand in many of NASA's projects. Now they're offering a first ever course this fall that may help current engineers share some of that knowledge. The Night Team's Patty Santos reports. Three, two, one. Eyes will be on the sky this weekend for the expected historic SpaceX launch. And it's future moments like this that Grant Musgrove hopes he can have a hand in helping to continue. You really don't have to do much other than just be, be open and want to help teach others how to do this kind of stuff. Musgrove, a research and development manager at Southwest Research Institute, will be welcoming rocket engineers this October to a liquid propellant design and analysis for launch vehicles course. <laughs> Basically, the engineers that know the fuel system that makes rockets go, something that becomes way more complex in outer space. So you don't have any gravity, gravity keeping your propellant at the bottom of the tank, which you would pull from to start the engine. Um, that fluid, that propellant is actually just floating around and uh, climbing up the walls uh, just due to surface tension. Musgrove says it's the first course of its kind. One of the, the reasons why we're doing this course is because there really isn't a good place to get this kind of training anywhere. Um, you, it's, it's generally on the job. He says with the biggest innovations made by NASA's top experts more than 30 years ago and those experts now retiring, it's time to pass on the knowledge. There's a lot of companies that are subcontracted that provide a lot of components for these rockets. And so sometimes they need analysis work done. Sometimes it's a small company um, that is just doing a smaller type of rocket, not, not big launch rockets. SWRI has been involved with several NASA projects in the past and currently, including the exploration of Jupiter through the Juno mission, studying the sun's atmosphere and sending satellites into orbit. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. As we mentioned earlier, the SpaceX rocket launch is scheduled to happen tomorrow. It'll be the first launch from American soil in nearly a decade. That launch is scheduled for 2.22 p.m., but the weather forecast will once again determine whether the rocket will actually be able to take off. You can watch the launch live right here on KSAT 12 and on our website. We'll have multiple live streams of the launch that will actually begin at 10 a.m. Water parks reopened today as, a par as part of phase two for Governor Greg Abbott's executive orders to reopen Texas. However, you might not see crowds just yet. Many water parks announcing they won't open until mid-June. Under the governor's orders, water parks have to limit capacity to 25%. Child play areas and video arcade areas within the parks are also to remain closed. And park visitors must be in groups smaller than 10. Despite the governor's approval to reopen, many parks are waiting.
Splash Town will reopen on June 11th. Aquatica San Antonio will reopen June 6th. Schlitterbahn in New Braunfels is expected to reopen mid-June, though there's not yet a set time frame for when SeaWorld and Six Flags Fiesta Texas will reopen. It is a special place for those with and without special needs. Morgan's Wonderland announced they will remain closed through 2020 yesterday because of concerns about the spread of COVID-19. This includes Morgan's Inspiration Island Splash Park. That news hitting a lot of people hard, including one local boy we talked to this morning along with his family. Lucius has a brain injury that affects his ability to retain information. Most every day, a family member drives him by Morgan's Wonderland's front gate to help him understand why they won't be attending this summer. Remember the times that he used to come here every day to ride the carousel, to play on the slide, to ride the cars. He uh, really, truly enjoys it, as I'm sure all the children that come and see the park every day. That's Lucius's grandmother. Yesterday we spoke with founder Gordon Hartman, who says the park will open their doors again when the time is right. Also reopening in phase two recreational sports programs for adults. Those can start this Sunday. However, games and competitions can begin on June 15th. Also, all driver education programs can resume operations immediately. The desecration of a monument uh, is is never to be condoned. Um, and, you know, we hope that uh, that person is is apprehended. Well, that was Mayor Ron Nuremberg responding to the graffiti spray painted on the Alamo Cenotaph today. 25 year old Noah Escamilla was arrested in connection with that crime. The message was discovered shortly after midnight. The tagging seemed to condemn white supremacy, capitalism and the Alamo itself. Police found a similar message on the wall of a parking garage on La Soya Street. Right now, officials are working to figure out the best way to remove the paint without damaging the monument. It's critical that uh, as, as they plan to remove the, the graffiti from the cenotaph from the marble, it is done in, in, in the proper way. Meanwhile, Alamo officials released a statement saying in part, as we condemn this vandalism, we salute the San Antonio Police Department for its swift action to investigate. The conservator of the Alamo is planning to assess the damage on Monday. Take a look at this drone footage showing the aftermath of protesters from Thursday night. This is outside the third precinct police department that was set on fire during demonstrations Thursday night as people gathered to protest the deadly arrest of George Floyd on Monday. Those demonstrators are not slowing down tonight, even after the former Minneapolis officer who pressed his knee on Floyd's neck is charged with third degree murder charges. Prosecutors also investigating if the other former officers involved will also face charges. ABC's Zareen Shah has the details. For the fourth night in a row, violence in Minneapolis following a black man dying while being pinned to the ground by a white police officer. 500 National Guard soldiers deployed and eight o'clock curfew, but crowds on the street. All of this hours after former officer Derek Chauvin was arrested and charged with the murder of George Floyd. Please, please, I can't breathe. Please, man, please, man. This video sparking national outrage showing Chauvin digging his knee into Floyd's neck while he was handcuffed. He's not resisting arrest or nothing. Prosecutors say the defendant had his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds in total. Two minutes and 53 seconds of this was after Mr. Floyd was non-responsive. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin has been charged by the Hennepin County Attorney's Office with murder and with manslaughter. We are in the process of continuing to review the evidence. There may be subsequent charges later. ABC affiliate KSTP was there as Floyd's girlfriend reacted to the charges. This is the piece of justice. This is the first piece and, and it, needed to, <laughs> it needed to be done. It's time. Other officers involved in Floyd's arrest, Toe Tao, Thomas Lane, and J. Alexander Kung were fired. They are under investigation. I anticipate charges. Following charges against Chauvin, nationwide protests continued. These protests in Atlanta. 
And tonight, a newly found video of George Floyd shows him in his they own words, me. talking about oh, breaking the cycle of violence Come he on, witnessed. Home, One day it's going to be you and God. You're going up or you're going down. Floyd's family says through a lawyer, they want to see Chauvin face first degree murder charges. They also want to see the other officers involved arrested. Zorin Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. Meanwhile, here in San Antonio, a peaceful vigilant march is expected to fight for justice for George Floyd. The event is scheduled for Travis Park tomorrow at 5 p.m. It's being organized by the autonomous Brown Berets de San Anto through Facebook. They plan to bring awareness to police brutality while remembering those who have lost their lives to the issue. Those in attendance are asked to wear a mask and practice social distancing. And I have a bit of good news for you here. The aquifer, it's up again today, about seven tenths of a foot. But let's go back since our rains began about May 12th. The aquifer is up over 10 feet and now we're five feet above the May average. You know, right before the rains began and we got into the active pattern, we were within a week or so of stage one restrictions. And the rain came and now we're far from those stage one re restrictions. So that's nice. One side effect of the rain, of course, is mold. It's high again today. The count of 9600, almost 9700 temperature wise right now. 72 in Bulverde. Randolph's at 74 Hondo now at 75. When we wake up tomorrow, I'm thinking mid 60s for a good portion of us, but lower 60s as you get in parts of the hill country, even Bernie area about 62 degrees and pleasant in 68. All right, I'll talk about our next chance of rain, which does come this weekend in a few minutes. Thank you, Adam. Still to come on the night feed, how one local organization coming together to help the homeless and their pets in need during this pandemic. Plus, it's on to the next stage in life for Jefferson High School seniors. See their special graduation celebration coming up next. A local nonprofit organization is committed to helping pets and people in need. Hope for Hounds is hosting a free event for the homeless community, offering dog vaccines and more. Tiffany Huertas has a look at how it's changing lives. It is hard for me to get them the medicines and the shots that they do need. Yvette Garcia says she's experienced homelessness since 2012, but recently she found a place to live with her four-legged friend Elsa. And thanks to a local nonprofit organization, Elsa will soon get her first shots. It is such an amazing blessing for us, the ones that can't truly afford it, because believe it or not, our animals to us are everything. Yvette says Elsa helped her through many tough days. It's what keeps us going. And for us not to have them, it's a whole lot harder on. The organization Hope for Hounds is hosting its first free clinic on Sunday. Their mission is to provide free vaccines, health checks, and spay and neuter services to the dogs of the homeless population. We're going to be providing a full vet care wellness check of basic vaccines as a three, three year babies, a Bordetella, Parvo, Distemper. Founder Ross Powell says the concept began while volunteering at Church Under the Bridge, another nonprofit organization helping the homeless community. My wife and I served down at Church Under the Bridge every month, and we saw while we were feeding them, we saw there was a lot of dogs with them as well. Powell knew they had to do something. We want them to know that people care about them, that they're not marginalized, that people do care and love them. It lets us know that even though we are in a hard situation, um, that we are still loved by people out there, that people do still care for us, and that we are not forgotten. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Bear County officials will be distributing plexiglass kits next week. Officials say it's their way to assist small businesses in reopening safely. The kits will be given out on Monday, June 1st from 8.30 until 10.30 in the morning at the Freeman Coliseum. The kits will be available to businesses who have pre-registered before the event. We'll have information on how to sign up on our website along with more distribution dates. A long rows of cars and loud honking is not how these high school seniors thought their graduation would go. But the celebration must go on.
Dozens of cars and trucks showed up with balloons and decorations to send off the Jefferson High School class of 2020. The car graduation parade was organized by school officials to make sure the students didn't feel like they missed out on being acknowledged for their accomplishments. It's something that I think it's going to be a memory for them since this is, you know, everything going on. And I think with this is bringing everybody more closer. Staff and parents say they wanted to do this parade to show their support of the graduating seniors. I'm glad they did. You know, our Greg Simmons went to Jefferson. Did you know that? Uh, yes, yeah. we do. Tomorrow on GMSA, we're continuing to showcase graduating seniors who are making a big difference even in the midst of this pandemic. During our great graduates segment, we're going to introduce you to a young man who is also graduating with his associate's degree. You don't want to miss his story and why he is so passionate about helping others. It's tomorrow on Good Morning San Antonio. Take a live look outside with the uh, live cam. 77 degrees out there, weekend upon us, and uh, I'm ready. Yeah, we're all yes. ready for this weekend, especially because it's not going to be anything like uh, the past several days that we've experienced and even last weekend's weather when it got all active. But I do want to take a look at the rain chances because they do jump up a little bit, particularly into Sunday, and that's most, mostly Sunday afternoon and Sunday evening. Now, that doesn't mean we're looking at any strong thunderstorms, but rain chances are back in the picture. And actually, this rain shouldn't be coming at a cost, which is nice. I do want to show you some beautiful photos from this evening. Here's our sunset. This one was taken, I believe, on the north side of town, looking at our gorgeous sunset, and you can't beat this from Canyon Lake. Look at all that spectacular color. We had a beautiful sunrise that looked very similar, and then a sunset. Very rewarding this evening. And the reason we got that that nice color on the clouds, because we had those high, thin clouds streaming overhead, then that low angle light bounces off them and you can get that those nice colors but no rainfall out there to speak of and actually today we were close enough to the upper level high which is over the four corners close enough to it to influence our weather enough to give us a nice sunny day and tomorrow's going to be the same however there's this little feature right down here just south of brownsville and this little circulation in the upper levels that's an upper level low pressure system an upper level disturbance that's going to be meandering its way slowly basically into Mexico, but very close to Texas and then arcing its way toward us in the days ahead. And that's why you saw those elevated rain chances by Sunday and on into next week. So let's talk about this feature. There's that broad circulation. It's going to move its way into Mexico tomorrow. We'll still have a sunny day. It's really not going to be all that different than today. Bright sunshine, 60s in the morning, near 90 in the afternoon. Then we get into Sunday. It's creeping a little closer to us slinging moisture our way. So we'll wake up to clouds in the morning and maybe even a few showers far south of town and especially closer to the coastline. Then we get into Saturday afternoon, more clouds than sunshine, and these showers start to pop up. Now, it's not going to be the kind of rain that everybody gets, but it is going to be more of that uh, more tropical in nature. Those big fat raindrops, real heavy downpour for a period of time, some lightning and thunder, but we're not expecting these storms to become rowdy at all. Just some heavy rain associated with them and some snap crackle pop to go with it and scattered. Not everybody's going to see it. 89 was our high temperature today after a morning low of 68. Right now we're in the 70s, 72 in New Braunfels. Stinson is 76 and Halota is currently at 72. Still hanging on to 83 though in Del Rio. That's one of the warmer locations. Not overly humid today. I don't know if you noticed that, but we had that northerly breeze and that kept that really humid air, the thick humidity right along the coastline and it's still there. And I don't anticipate a resurgence of that moisture until we get into Sunday. So as for your day tomorrow, 65 in the morning, mostly sunny all day long, near 90 in the afternoon. So again, it's going to look and feel a lot like what we had today. Then we get into Sunday. Temperatures don't change much. Morning in the 60s, afternoon in the mid 80s. But you have the, you add the extra cloud cover and that chance of rain, about 40% coverage, I think, across South Texas. Again, some downpours here and there. Same story into Monday. So Monday and even on into Tuesday, we'll have those scattered showers and weak thunderstorms is what we're expecting. Just garden variety activity should give some folks some good rain, more soaking rain to put a dent in that drought and continue to fill the aquifer. And those rain chances as of now start to taper off as we get farther into next week. So not too hot, though. Look at that. Mostly in the 80s to near 90. Yeah, not bad. Thank you, Adam. All right. You know, both of my grandmothers were very strong women. Yeah. 
They didn't hesitate to tell you their opinion. So this story with a new cowboy rings very true to me, Larry. It does indeed. Uh, Cowboys uh, defensive end Alden Smith, we know, has had some trouble during his NFL career for off the field issues. Well, his grandmother inspired him to turn things around. Plus, the NBA has a target date set to resume the season. Coming up. Friday, July 31st, that's the target date the NBA has set for its return, according to multiple reports. That's 20 weeks after play was suspended due to COVID-19. We still don't have a format, but the Woj says next Thursday, the NBA Board of Governors will plan to vote with an expectation that owners will approve Adam Silver's recommendation on a format to restart the season in Orlando, sources told ESPN. Teams expect his plan to include invitations for 20 to 22 teams to resume the season. Now, when play was stopped, the Spurs had the 20th best record this season at 27 and 36. So that scenario means the silver and black will get to continue their season. The Dallas Mavericks reopened their practice facility Thursday for limited player workouts. Team personnel sprayed down equipment before taking it inside the facility. As of Tuesday, the Mavericks were one of eight teams yet to reopen their practice facilities, joining the Spurs, Celtics, Knicks, Bulls, Pistons, Wizards and the Warriors. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Cowboys defensive end Alden Smith is on the comeback trail following a promising start to his NFL career. He was drafted by the 49ers in 2011. He had 33 and a half sacks in his first two seasons. Then in 2013, alcohol and substance abuse right derailed his career. He last played in the league with Oakland in November 2015 when he was suspended for violating the NFL substance abuse policy. Last week, he was reinstated by the league, and today he told reporters that his ailing grandmother implored him to change his life before she died of complications from Lou Gehrig's disease. My grandma passed last year, and that was she was somebody who I was very close to. And um, around the time she passed, and my life wasn't where I wanted it to be. And um, before the last time I seen her, she was able to, you know, get some words or get a message to me, and that was just, you know, do better and, and basically go out here and get what you deserve. And um, that stuck with me. The 30-year-old Smith says he's out to prove he's the same player, but a different person. Houston Texans defensive end J.J. Watt is getting ready for his 10th season in the NFL. They drafted him in 2011, and the last four seasons, though, have been tough on J.J. because of injuries. Last season, he was placed on injured reserve after eight games with a season-ending torn peck. He's a three-time NFL Defensive Player of the Year, but he's missing what he wants the most, and that's a Super Bowl championship. I feel good. I mean, that's that's the goal. That's why we're here. You know, you play the game to win a Super Bowl. That's the goal. Um, so it's that's the driving force. I mean, it's among many things, obviously, but that's always number one is to help your team, help your city get to that game and to win it. JJ also said he hopes to play his entire career with the Texans. And coming up after the break, a beer company poking fun at the Houston Astros. The Johnson Jaguars varsity football food drive yesterday was a tremendous success. Head coach Mark Soto said they raised more than 400 pounds of food for the San Antonio Food Bank. They filled five 44-gallon bins up twice with food to spare. The Jags coming through big time. Plus, this allowed members of the team to actually hang out in person while doing a good deed. It's kind of awkward, to tell you the truth, because we've been talking on Zooms back and forth for the last four weeks, so this is our first face-to-face, -face, and everybody's kind of looking at each other. It's like two dogs in a yard. We're not sure yet, so we're going to figure it out real quick, though. With everything going on, not everyone's as you know fortunate as some people, and I know this, this community comes out and supports us on Friday nights, and um, just it's good to give back. JAG Student Council also collected $5,500 for the SA Food Bank. Cameron Caldwell attends Veterans Memorial High School where he plays both soccer and football. Last season in late November during the Patriots second round playoff loss, he suffered a brutal knee injury hurting his PCL and MCL. His road to recovery was tough, but he's back and splitting the uprights. It was just really scary. Like I thought that my career was over because I have a lot of friends who have torn their ACLs and you know, I thought that I had torn my ACL, went to the doctor and found that I didn't. So that gave me a little bit of hope when I found that it wasn't my ACL and it was my PCL. You know, he told me I could make a full recovery, but, you know, I had the thoughts like, oh, this brace is just going to, it's going to limit me. And I'm still, I was very afraid that I wasn't going to be the same like I was before. 
We'll have more with Caldwell Sunday night an instant replay. He talks rehab and how much his family and support team helped him out. Departed Souls Brewing out of New Jersey is offering a new beer, Trash Can Banger IPA, to poke fun at the Houston Astros for their 2017 sign-stealing scandal. The beer comes in white, orange, and yellow striped cans that recall the Tequila Sunrise uniform once worn by the Strohs. The brewery said in its promotional release, quote, beer releases are like a pitcher's arsenal, and you never really know what's coming, and when unless, of course, you cheat, end quote. Ooh. There is no doubt who they're targeting. <laughs> with that. If you had any doubt, just look at the label. Exactly right. Wow. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. We'll be right back. The coronavirus pandemic continues to take a toll across the country with over 20,000 new confirmed cases and more than 101,000 deaths so far. At least 14 states have seen an increase in cases. Businesses are continuing to slowly reopen with many taking major precautions to keep employees and customers safe. ABC's Zareen Shaw has a story. As some Americans return to work, major changes are being made to keep employees safe. Nevada's governor has given the go ahead for casinos to open next Thursday. We're going to be regularly cleaning the, the cards uh, and the dice, like for example, in craps. Every time a new shooter take the dice, the dice will be disinfected. Caesars Palace and Bellagio showing ABC safety measures they are taking. At an MGM Resorts property, you will see that we have put plexiglass in uh, at each of our table games, um, especially with, with blackjack, and we've, we've reduced the number of seats down from six to three. On the other side of the country, in New York City, a major announcement from the U.S. epicenter of the outbreak. Officials expecting to enter phase one reopening on June 8th. The city's mayor adding 200 to 400,000 workers will likely go back to work mid-June. New York's governor signed an executive order yesterday allowing private businesses to turn away customers without masks. That store owner has a right to protect themselves. That store owner has a right to protect the other patrons in that store. Meantime, businesses are eagerly awaiting news when they will be allowed to reopen. In North Carolina, organizers are still working on plans for an in-person Republican National Convention in August. President Trump threatened to move this event from the state if the party wasn't allowed to fill the arena. The harsh realities of millions of Americans who've been out of work and having very little money continues. Food distribution lines like this one in Los Angeles over a mile long. Many out of work, some fearing they'll be out of their home next. What's the next steps for you? Homelessness. The Labor Department also released tips that employers can take to keep people safe in the workspace, like repositioning workspaces and staggering breaks. Zorin Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. The city of San Antonio is considering a plan to help connect students in up to 50 neighborhoods to at-home Internet access. It's a $27 million piece of a wider COVID-19 community recovery and resiliency plan. It's the council will vote on that, by the way, next week. The idea is to put up private wireless networks in neighborhoods, which students could access to their school district's networks. The city says it can help some districts that haven't had a chance to build up some of the infrastructure needed. If you're a student, you would see your ISD's network available on your list of networks in your home, and you would be able to click that network and log into it exactly as if you were sitting in the school classroom. A, de a definitive list of where these networks would go has not been released, but a city official says they would try to prove the concept in a neighborhood in the L Lanier High School area first. We call on the experts to set, separate some of the facts from the fear that are out there surrounding COVID-19 and this coronavirus pandemic that we find ourselves in. And we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Robert A. Frolickstein, who is on the front lines, an ER doctor here in San Antonio. And he's been helping us through since really this pandemic began. Thank you for joining us today, doctor. My pleasure. What are you seeing in the ER right now? I mean, is it getting back to normal? Uh, well, no, it's not getting back to normal. I mean, we're still seeing COVID patients. Um, and, you know, I think one day this week, San Antonio had uh, nearly 100 patients admitted to the hospital with, with COVID. And that's near, near the highest number we've had. I can't remember the exact number, but it's near the highest number. So they're certainly still out there. 
And, you know, we're just seeing some really incredibly sick patients with COVID. Now, again, the vast majority of people are probably not going to become that ill, but there are many that are becoming very, very ill with COVID. So. Now, Dr. Frolickstein, I know that we've spoken to you in in weeks past, and one of the things that you mentioned was that you weren't seeing patients coming in for things that they normally would, a heart attack or just, you know, day-to-day -day things that the emergency room typically sees. Are you still seeing that, or are you seeing a sense of normalcy in regard to that, that folks are feeling the confidence to come back in? Yeah, you know, I think we're inching back closer to normal. We're certainly not there, but we're inching back closer to normal. I'm certainly um, encouraged that I, that I think the feeling out there is that, you know, the ER is, is the place to go. If you if you think you have a critical illness or if you're injured severely, come to the ER. And the fact that more people are coming makes me uh, at least hopeful that they know that it's a safe place to go. It's it's. Just, it's a safe place. And that's that's the thing I think, I don't know that we can say enough, and it seems like we say it in every time we do this interview, but how, is it, you work at Methodist. If somebody yes, walks in the door at Methodist ER, what's the first thing that's gonna happen? So they'll, they'll be screened. We have a screener that asks them if they're there for, because they're a visitor or if, uh, if but if they're having any symptoms whatsoever. And then uh, if they're having any symptoms, then they are, uh, put in an area that's different than those people that aren't having symptoms. Uh, and so we do a good job of identifying those at risk of having the infection, keeping away from the rest of the patients in the hospital. Right. They're separated. I mean, they're, they're, it's a total different area of the hospital. Correct. Now, Dr. Frolickson, we um, have entered into these different phases of reopening. You know, week by week, the governor kind of eases those restrictions a little bit. When will we see the first signs that these reopenings are going well or perhaps not so well? Yeah, you know, so the vast majority of, of people who are going to become with ill with COVID-19 after exposure are gonna do so within 10 to 14 days. And so I think what we're going to see is, uh, and we're past that for many of the openings, right? And so that's a good sign and it's encouraging um, what what I think we need to be on the a lookout for as, we, as the summer progresses is those periods of two weeks after either new openings happen or big events happen where there's a high density of people. Memorial Day, for instance, we'll be interested to see if we're going to see a spike in uh, patients after Memorial Day or after churches start opening, those sorts of things. And what'd you say, like 10 to 14 days? That's kind of the, the uh, yeah. would you call it the incubation time where we would see some people come become ill? Correct. Some people are, are sooner than that, but I think it's 90% are going to be that are gonna become ill or are gonna be ill within 14 days. Some, some other uh, hospitals around the country are seeing younger people suffering from heart problems or heart attacks or strokes that are related to COVID-19. They do a test and they find out that they did have COVID, they just were asymptomatic, except for these particular things with their heart. Are you seeing any of those instances in San Antonio? So we're certainly seeing patients who come in for another reason that we test because they're going to need to go to the operating room or for whatever reason we test for COVID and they are positive. We've seen that in patients with hip fractures, etc. I think what you're referring to is that this virus is, is uh, it's peculiar in that it appears like it has caused heart attacks and strokes in some pretty young people without otherwise risk factors. I personally have not seen that. I don't think any of my colleagues have seen that. But I think that's more of a, a statistical anomaly than anything, right? There's not that many of those that happen, so it wouldn't be that rare that uh, I wouldn't personally see it. It's just one of those peculiar things this virus is causing. And before we go, do you have any final words or some parting thoughts for our viewers? I, I just I, I urge people not to get their guard down. I mean, this you know it kind of feels like oh we're through this, and in some sense that's true. I, I don't think we're at risk, or at least I think the risk of us being overwhelmed, the healthcare system being overwhelmed is pretty low at this point. You know, my biggest fear going into this was working in the emergency room, seeing people literally dying in front of me, 
and I couldn't do anything because the resources weren't available. I don't think that's going to happen anymore. What I, but, but this virus is still out there, and it's still a dangerous virus. And what's odd about it is it's hard for me to protect myself. It, 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 I have to rely on others to help me protect myself. And that's the whole deal with the uh, physical distancing and wearing the mask kind of thing. So I still think that stuff is very important. So please do it. Dr. Robert A. Frolickstein, we really appreciate your time. Thank you again for joining us. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. Researchers are learning more about the risks that cancer patients face if they become sick with COVID-19. Patients with advanced cancer were more than five times more likely to die. Researchers looked at data from 928 COVID-19 cases between March and April. They found that even if their cancer wasn't spreading, the coronavirus infection nearly doubled their risk of dying. Overall, 13% of patients died during the study period and within 30 days of being diagnosed with COVID-19. More than 300 employees at a North Texas meat packing plant have tested positive for COVID-19. 326 of the 1,604 people who work at the Tyson Beef and Pork Plant in Sherman have the virus. That's about 20% of its employees. More than 200 of them were tested by state health officials. The rest were tested by their own health care providers. It has proven difficult to stop the virus from spreading in meat processing plants, and they are commonly hot spots for infection. A Central Texas bar taking a stance on the issue of wearing masks by banning them. The Liberty Tree Tavern in Elgin, that's east of Austin, has a statement posted outside that says if patrons feel a need to wear a mask, they should probably stay home until it's safe. Elgin has a population of about 10,000 with 52 reported COVID-19 cases. Other businesses there do require masks or have made wearing them optional. The ban at the Liberty Tree has locals on both sides talking. They're taking chances they don't need to take, especially if they're in public service. I don't know anyone personally, and I know a lot of people in Elgin, and I know no one personally that's gotten the virus or that has died. The people who have gone to the bar say it's taking some social distancing measures. Bars that reopen are supposed to keep in-person service at 25% occupancy. Video games, they're another way to stay busy at home, and you don't even have to be a serious gamer to get in on the action. Online video game services are available by subscription, and as 12 on your site's Marilyn Moritz tells us, you don't even need a gaming console. Like a lot of us, Molly Davis has been stuck at home for weeks. For a little entertainment, she logs on to video games. My console of choice is definitely Nintendo Switch. You can lose yourself in a game. It's really helpful when you have so much downtime. Even if you don't have a Nintendo Switch, a new crop of video game subscription services from big tech names like Apple, Google, and Microsoft can be played on a device you already have. It's similar to Netflix where you pay 5 to $10 a month, and in exchange for that, you get access to a library of hundreds of video games. You can either download these games or stream these games and then play them on whatever device you have available. If you have an Apple computer, iPhone, or Apple TV, you can check out Apple Arcade for $5 a month. Microsoft's Xbox Game Pass is another option if you want to play popular games like Halo on your PC. Then there's Google Stadia. You can play on a phone or tablet or TV if you have a Chromecast ultra streaming device with a controller. To stream video games, you need to be sure to have a strong enough internet connection. It's also helpful to have your router nearby in the line of sight. And here's a bonus if you're home alone. You can play many of the games with friends. Being able to chat online while we play, it feels like they're in the room with you. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Live look outside with live cam right now, 77 degrees. What kind of weekend? Do we have in store? When you look at it compared to Saturday and today, kind of a 50 50 weekend, but Saturday is not going to be a washout. We'll just see our rain chances start to elevate later on in the day. So a sunny, sunny Saturday, it was really, it's really going to be a lot like what we had today. Rain chances return on Sunday, especially as we get deeper into the day. And overall, the seven day forecast, not overly hot compared to 
what it could be this time of year and what we've already experienced. So let's get right to it. Talk about a rainfall. I love this. After all the rain, 5.77 inches so far this May. That's two inches above average. All right, now you look at the yearly, the annual precipitation since January 1st, we've had 13 inches and that's about an inch and a half above average. Satellite and radar just show some high cloud streaming overhead. We'll probably be greeted by those again in the morning, but overall a very sunny day and a very pleasant, pleasant Saturday. We're close enough to the upper level high that's parked over New Mexico to give us a nice day today. And then also as we go into tomorrow, but not far to the south of us is this circulation right here, that counterclockwise circulation. That's an upper level disturbance and it's just drifting around right now. But indications are it's going to get closer to us as we get on into Sunday lasting into the first part of the week. So there's the upper level low already developed some showers down in deep south Texas, the valley, Mexico and even over the Gulf of Mexico. And it's going to throw some of that moisture our way, I think, in the coming days. So we get into tomorrow. No big changes. The low isn't all that close to us to really give us a big influence. The high is going to win out in that situation. Bright sunshine. Then we get into early Sunday morning. I think we'll wake up to a decent amount of cloud cover over spreading South Texas. It only thickens throughout the day and then some showers scattered in nature by the afternoon and evening on Sunday. So again, not a washout, just some scattered rain chances later on in the day. And I do think some of those will turn into some hefty downpours, the tropical downpours that we sometimes see. Heavy rain, a little bit of lightning and thunder, but we're not expecting anything strong or severe. So near 90 on your Saturday, 60s in the mornings all weekend long, 85 by Sunday afternoon. Then we get into Monday and Tuesday and we don't see a big shift in our weather pattern. We're going to keep those scattered or 40% rain chances through, mon through Monday and Tuesday. And as I mentioned, not too hot, upper 80s to near 90. We'll be right back after the break. A tornado touches down in San Antonio, leaving debris everywhere and some homes severely damaged. This week also brought people together to remember the lives of soldiers and our military who made the ultimate sacrifice to protect our nation. Here's tonight's Night Beat in Review. These brave souls gave of themselves, some paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we could be standing here talking with you about what they did to preserve this nation. While the pandemic limited the ceremonies that usually occur at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery, there were still flags laid out at the grave sites. Others gave salute to pay their respects and families showed up to pass on stories to the next generation. And rivers in Texas overflowing with tubers this Memorial Day weekend. If I get it, everybody else getting it. Hey, it's like coming out of the Wild Horse subdivision in the northwestern part of the county. Damage along Palomino Path confirmed to be an EF1 tornado, and the family took shelter in a restroom away from windows. Afterwards, they took a look at the damage, realizing everyone inside, including the family dog, had been spared from the worst. Tornado, this is the part of town we're looking at, just south of Holotus, and basically we're looking at 1604 and Braun Road, north of Shanefield, and that's this circle. That's Palomino Pass, and that's the only damage from last, no last night's storms where we have a confirmed tornado. Hail in Alamo Heights. This is very large hail as well. This is a really impressive picture out at 1604 in Bolverde. Very large hail there. Anytime you get a hail greater than the size of quarters, that's when it can cause some serious damage. And we have seen that all around the Alamo City tonight. This is out of Canyon Lake tonight. The sky, a mix of red and blue there with bursts of lightning, as you can see. Flashes of light all captured on camera. That is cardboard covering the windshield in hopes of offering some protection for that windshield of the vehicle. Come out here and he actually has the whole tree on the, on his roof. Armed with a saw, neighbors gathered to help break the debris down. Rick, who's in a wheelchair, says he was in disbelief. Something huge came and sat on my house. Rough as it is for some of us and here with Corona 19, come on. If we need any more, but thank the Lord, we're all here helping each other out. Thank God for these amazing neighbors. I just, I can't say enough about them.
All right, check this out. Someone who works at the Brookfield Zoo in Illinois started painting rocks and putting them around the zoo just to make people smile. There are nearly 60 of them, small rocks with animals, flowers, encouraging messages scattered throughout the zoo. The artist is a mystery, but the zoo is hoping their rocking good idea encourages others to paint their own rocks at home and post them on social media with the hashtag Brookfield Zoo Rocks. Very cool. Well, love never fails, and couples in Brazil are hoping that's the case. Every day, dozens of couples have been taking advantage of a drive through wedding facility in Rio de Janeiro. While wearing masks and staying in their cars, couples exchange vows and rings while a registry official oversees the ceremony. A drive through wedding. Yeah. Hmm. Doesn't Vegas have one? I think they right? do now, Vegas yeah. Vegas has one? Well, I think a lot yeah. of cities do. One city in Florida does, where they can legally marry. Yeah, marry, that's yeah. all you need. That's all you need. Legally get it done. <laughs> right. okay. Sunny, 89 tomorrow. I don't know, Steve's face right now, I don't, I can't read him. I just know I, I couldn't get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd be fine with the drive through wedding. I don't think my significant other would be. Yeah, you know, and I'm with her, I'm a little more traditional, sorry. Yeah, I, know, I know, you are. Yeah. You're, you're Mr. Traditional, really. Have a good <laughs> weekend. Good night. Have a great weekend. <laughs>